Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 103. 2011 is here and it's promising to be an exciting year for those of us who are climbing our family trees. I just booked my flights to the Roots Tech Conference being held in Salt Lake City in February. And right after that, I'm going to be heading over to London to speak at the Who Do You Think You Are live conference. I am very excited about that. And uh, in fact, just this last week, they got in touch with me and asked if I would be able to answer questions at the Ask the Experts booth in the exhibit hall. So I'll be doing that. And if by chance you are over there at Who Do You Think You Are live, I hope you'll stop by the Ask the Experts booth. I'll be there uh, between four and six on Friday and about the same time, I think, on Saturday as well, in addition to the class I'll be teaching on Sunday. It should be a lot of fun helping British researchers track down their Yankee counterparts. (laughs) And I hope that you had a wonderful Christmas and New Year's. We sure did here at the cookhouse. I was very happy to have all three of my daughters here for Christmas. And now it's official. Our grandson Davy's favorite gifts were the wads of torn Christmas paper and the empty boxes. (laughs) They were a hit with him. Uh, I think he'll eventually get around to trying out some of the toys he got, but he had a blast. So now that I have all the Christmas decorations put away, I am ready to dig into genealogy as I hope that you are. So let's start off by talking about what's been going on in the genealogy news. About a week before Christmas, the Library and Archives Canada announced that they have made the 1916 census of the Prairie Provinces available online. And I hit the website right away uh, since I had a Cook ancestor to track down in Saskatchewan. Now, the challenge is that the collection doesn't have an every name index or even a head of the household index. So it takes some browsing. Don't get discouraged. I had no trouble finding the ancestor that I was looking for. Um, The pages are very easy to navigate and to browse. You can access the digitized images of the 1916 census online in two different ways. You can do it through a database that is searchable by province, district name, district number, and sub-district number. Or you can go through the research tool called Microform Digitization, and you can browse the microfilm reels page by page. So I'll have links for you in the show notes to both of those databases and tools, and you can try it out for yourself. Also in the archive news, there is a terrific new video out from the National Archives Records Administration. It is part of NARA's Inside the Vaults series, and it's called Inside the Vaults, Discover the Civil War. In this video, it's just under four minutes. The creators of NARA's Discovering the Civil War exhibition share little known facts and extraordinary discoveries found in the fantastic Civil War holdings over at the National Archives. The video also features rarely seen original footage from Civil War reunions in 1917 in Vicksburg and in 1938 in Gettysburg. You actually see those living Civil War veterans in the movies. Part two of the Discovering the Civil War exhibit opened back on November 10th of 2010 at the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and it's going to run through April 17th of 2011. If by chance you are in the D.C. area, you might want to check it out. And by the way, there is a really cool new feature to this video, I noticed. It's called Interactive Transcript. So, for example... I wanted to mention here on the podcast that they give a really neat explanation of the origin of the word shoddy, which comes from the Civil War era. And so after watching the video, I scrolled through the transcript, found the sentence about shoddy, and it was at one minute and 12 seconds into the video. And when I clicked on that point in the transcript, the video started to play at that exact location. Pretty sweet. I don't know if that's going to be uh, available throughout YouTube or if it's just something that NARA has come up with for their YouTube channel, but it's pretty slick. 
So you can check out the channel at tiny.cc slash vaults. I think they've come up with a, a tiny URL that will get you there that's much easier to deal with. And I'll have a link again for you in the show notes. And for more information on the Discovering the Civil War exhibition, head on over to archives.gov slash exhibits slash civil dash war. Next, it's been hitting the mainstream news that the BBC iPlayer is going to go international. So if you're like me and you live outside of Great Britain, at some point, you probably popped over to the BBC website to check out the British version of the TV series, Who Do You Think You Are? Only to discover that the video is shown on the BBC iPlayer and it's blocked to international visitors to the site. You can't watch their video. It's only available to those in the UK. Bummer. The scoop is that the BBC plans to offer overseas access to the BBC iPlayer. However, it's not going to be free. And in fact, I've even read speculation that an individual episode could run upwards of $10. Can you imagine? <laughs> now, that really seems over the top, but it's very possible that they will offer a kind of a combination of subscriptions, including a, a download to own or a pay-per-view. I, I hope something <laughs> that takes into account that you might want to watch a whole season or you might want to watch five episodes or something. So hopefully they will make it affordable. But also, the Macworld website has been reporting that it's going to first be available internationally on the iPad, and then it will spread out from there. So those of you who got an iPad for Christmas, you're in luck. You might be able to get a hold of that BBC iPlayer and check out the British version of Who Do You Think You Are? So stay tuned for more details. When I hear more, I'll report it here on the podcast. Now, on the blogging front, genealogy blogger and friend of the podcast, A.C. Ivory, announced right after the new year that he has launched a new version of his Find My Ancestors blog. According to his press release, Find My Ancestor provides various services to the genealogy and family history community, including education, design, family history, library research assistance, that's always nice, and much more. And if you're a Mac user, you are definitely going to want to check out AC's blog because that is really one of his specialties, using the Mac and, you know, for genealogy. So you can check out the new and improved blog at blog.findmyancestor.com. We wish you great success, AC. And several of you have written in about how some of the genealogy Google gadgets that you use for your iGoogle page, they stop working after a while. And the original Genealogy Gems podcast gadget in the iGoogle gadget directory is one of those. <laughs> and that's because Google doesn't provide a way for developers to edit or to update their existing gadgets. Now, a favorite gadget developer of mine is Phil Hayes, and you've heard me talk about his serious genealogy Google gadgets in the past here on the show. Well, I noticed that some of his also were no longer working. So I dropped Phil an email, and he says that he recently made some significant upgrades to the gadgets and to his server for his website and was forced to post new ones instead of updating the existing ones for just the same reason that I just mentioned. When the old ones load, you should get a message that provides a link to the new updated gadgets, but I noticed that that doesn't always happen. So Phil has put together a list of his updated gadgets on his website, which you can find at Sirius, and it's S-I-R-I-U-S, genealogy.com, slash toolbox, slash Google underscore gadgets, slash index dot CFM. And of course, I'll have it for you in the show notes. Just click on the link for the gadget that you want to add, and then click the Get It Now button and follow the simple instructions, and you'll find that gadget pops up in the upper left-hand corner of your iGoogle homepage. And I see that looking here at the website, he has some, some fun new ones. There's the Genealogy Word of the Day gadget, which is kind of neat and a great way to brush up on your genealogy vocab. And there is an abbreviation Word of the Day gadget for those pesky abbreviations that you come across in records. So you can test yourself to see if you know what the abbreviation stands for and then click the Reveal It button to see if you're right. 
Another great way to improve your genealogy skills just a little bit each day. And finally, here's an item that Alert Podcast listener Kathy Ott sent me the other day. She says, I've had this newspaper clipping on my desk for a couple of months and finally have time to share it. Since it's a little older, I was unable to find a current link to the article which appeared in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, but was written for the Toledo Blade. Here's what happened in McPherson Cemetery, located in Clyde, Sandusky County, Ohio. Quote, more than 170 headstones were knocked over or broken, and flowers and other items from 50 other grave sites were scattered around the municipal cemetery during three nights of vandalism in late August. A 17-year-old boy admitted his involvement in the spree and cooperated with investigators. He had no prior delinquency record. Juvenile Court Judge Brad Smith wanted to make sure the youth understood the history that he disturbed. So, in addition to a 90-day sentence in the Juvenile Detention Center and monetary restitution, this was part of his sentence. As part of the Clyde Youth Sentence for Delinquency in connection with vandalism, Smith ordered that he perform 200 hours of community service, specifically that he spend part of that time researching the lives and history of some of the people whose gravestones he damaged, end quote. She says, all well and good, but this judge took an extra step, quote, the youth will then have to make public presentations to family members and veterans groups as well as to the judge, end quote. Can you imagine, she says, being a family member and listening to that? I think I would come prepared with questions. Thought you might like to hear about this novel approach to a very unfortunate event. That's a great story, Kathy. So what do you guys think? Was that the right punishment? I think it sort of sounds like justice was actually being served. Oh, and by the way, here's a little search tip for you. Now, when it comes to newspapers... I find that the web page addresses get moved around all the time. Often they post an article on the main website, and then after some time passes, then they move the article into like an archive section of the website. But that means that the web page address gets changed, and the original link doesn't work anymore, like what Kathy found. I found that more than once, a great article will come up in a Google search that I do, and when I click the link to the article, the newspaper page says the article isn't located there anymore. Well, don't fret. Rather than trying to do a keyword search, like we usually do, in cases like this where you have some of the original text like Kathy did, just type a sentence or two exactly as it appears in the article or how it appears in the snippet that came with the search results where the article is now bad. You know, it shows you a little piece of the text from the article, even though the link doesn't work. In this case, I just typed a sentence or two exactly as Kathy had quoted it to me in the email, and that new web page for that article was the first item in the search results list. Uh, that's a little gem that works nearly every time. Okay, well, that's it for now with the genealogy news. So you're up next in the mailbox. From my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I'll bet he's glad For more than any other A line from my old mother Bring me a letter From my hometown Okay, well, here in the mailbox I've got an email from new genealogy blogger Cynthia DeBach, who wrote in over the holidays to say, thanks to your help through Genealogy Gems, I started a blog. Let me know what you think. Cynthia's blog title is very straightforward. It's Genealogist, Archivist, Researcher. And you can find it at genealogist-archivist-researcher.blogspot.com. And the background graphic that she picked is, is just a, very appropriate. It's full of shelves of books, which, of course, looks great. And check out her first post. It's entitled, How I Got Started, 
I think it's always fun to hear how folks get bit by the genealogy bug. So I'll have a link directly to that article in the show notes. And congratulations on your blog, Cynthia. And thank you so much for writing. And here's an awfully nice email I received from listener Jen Alford. She writes, Lisa, I just want to thank you for the great how-to videos that you did for the Family History Wreath. I made one for my mom for Christmas this year, and I can't wait to see her reaction. I've also started a genealogy blog. Ah, another genealogy blogger. It's gen.gen. So her name is Jen, J-E-N, gen-gen.blogspot.com, and have been enjoying the responses from the family that read it. Thanks for all the inspiration. I'm a premium member, and I love all the extras you have on there. Keep up the great work. Have a great Christmas and a happy new year. Well, it doesn't get much better than that. Thank you so much, Jen. I really appreciate you writing in. And again, congratulations on the uh, genealogy blog. Okay, well, coming up next, I have a gem for you that explains the new chapter that's being written in Google Books. Roots Magic 4 has been completely rewritten and is now even more powerful and makes building your family tree easier than ever. I love it. With Roots Magic, you can add unlimited facts, find anyone in your database with lightning speed with Roots Magic Explorer, quickly and easily create perfectly formatted sources with the Roots Magic Source Wizard, create customized reports, and best of all, you can now take Roots Magic wherever your research takes you with the Roots Magic to go, which lets you run Roots Magic directly off your flash drive. And Roots Magic makes it a snap to share your family history, publish a book, create stunning wall charts, shareable CDs, even generate websites automatically from your data. To download your risk free trial of Roots Magic 4, head to rootsmagic.com. See why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. Well, on December 6th of 2010, on the Google blog, they reported that they had started a new chapter of their mission for Google Books, which is to improve access to the cultural and educational treasures that we know as books. Google eBooks is now available in the U.S. from a new Google eBook store. You can browse and search through the largest eBooks collection in the world with more than 3 million titles, including hundreds of thousands for sale. Now, I have a quick little two-minute video for you in the show notes that kind of gives you a quick overview of what they're talking about here. But the main thing that you notice right out of the gate is that Google Books homepage really looks quite different. It actually sort of mimics the uh, basic Google search page, and it offers you just three choices. You can search a topic in Google Books, you can go to your My Library in Google Books, or search the Google eBook store. So they have really integrated eBooks into the Google Books website. When you do a keyword search in the Google Books search box, you'll probably do a double take as I did the first time because the results page looks like a regular Google search results page. The only difference is that books is selected in the search options column, which is now on the left hand side of the page. It's a little odd and I sort of missed that Google Books homepage that kind of makes you feel like, okay, you're on a very distinct and individual website. But I think Google is still kind of going down that path of creating these tools and then sort of merging them together so that everything seems very interconnected. And uh, the new ebook store certainly has more of a standalone feel when you head to that part of the website. So with Kindles and Nooks and iPads, why is Google going into the ebook business? And what's going to set it apart? Well, when you watch the video that I have for you in the show notes, you really do get the picture. One of the big selling points is that it's supposed to be compatible with lots of different devices. You can read Google eBooks on the web, on Android phones, iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch through free apps, and any dedicated eBook reader that supports the Adobe eBook platform, which includes the Barnes & Noble Nook and Reader from Sony. I'll have a link for you in the show notes 
to a web page that lists all of the Adobe eBook platform supported devices that would also, again, work with the Google eBooks. And with the new Google eBooks web reader, you can buy, store, and read Google eBooks in the cloud. You know, they keep talking about in the cloud. This means that you can access your eBooks like you would messages in Gmail or photographs in Picasa using a free password protected Google account with unlimited ebook storage. So the benefit here is the unlimited storage. Uh, it's not taking up space on your your own personal computer. But then on the other hand, you know, you're not actually downloading these books and storing them and, and owning them yourself right there on your computer. It's definitely a new phase in terms of computers. And you know, I have my own uh, reservations, I think sometimes about the cloud, and the idea of kind of giving up some of that control. But I definitely can see that there are benefits, particularly for those who just love to read and have lots and lots of ebooks. And of course, this is a big advantage, this flexibility of working across these different devices, because many of the book readers that initially came out were fairly restrictive. You could really only get your ebooks from that provider that you got your e-reader from. Some other advantages to Google ebooks is that for many books, you can select which font or font size, day or night reading mode, and line spacing that suits you. And you can pick up the page where you left off when you're switching between devices, which would be pretty nice. So at one point you could be reading on your Nook and the next point you could be reading on your iPod Touch and you'll know exactly where you left off. Now you can buy new eBooks from the Google eBook store or get them from one of their independent bookseller partners. They're partnering with Powell's and also participating members of the American Booksellers Association. But even if you aren't interested in buying eBooks, don't overlook Google eBooks. And that's the real gem in this gem. Try this out. Go to google.com slash ebooks. So you're in the ebook store, search on the word genealogy. And then in the upper left hand corner under price, click the free only link. Now when I tried this, I got about 14 pages of free ebooks on the topic of genealogy, with many of them being family histories. There's also a date published link up there in the light blue bar where you find the price. And it's at the top of the screen. Click that and then the books published most recently are going to appear first and then the oldest ones will be last. Now this can be a little bit misleading with old out of copyright books because many of those are getting republished because they're, you know, out of copyright, they're easy to do, but they're being published pretty recently. So just be cautious. If you're looking for an older book, it may not be on the last pages, it may have actually been republished and show up on some of those first pages and the results. So there are definitely free books out there for you to check out. And finally, there's a Google eBooks feature that I really like. Uh, I kind of call it the snippet feature. If you just hover your mouse over a book that shows up on the results page after you do a search, a little snippet, kind of a small snippet view box will pop up. It gives you the author, the number of pages, the year of publication, and even a bit of the text. And this can be a really big time saver when you're trying to figure out if a book is right for you or your research. It can save you a lot of time. So try searches on topics of interest to you. Use those same Google search techniques and operators to try to get to what you're looking for. And you're probably going to be surprised at what you find. And since this is just getting off the ground, you will definitely want to check back periodically to see what's being added. Well, when it comes to gems in this episode, we are definitely on a Google spree, and this one is right in there. As promised, in episode number 102, we're going to talk in this gem about the new Google Earth version 6.0 that was launched on November 30th of 2010. You know, just when you get comfy, Google pulls the rug out from underneath of you a bit and changes things up. But that's okay 
because we're going to go through it together. And there are just too many cool things that you can do with Google Earth to pass up. So first of all, to download the new version 6.0 of Google Earth, just go to the same address of google.com slash earth. Now, the big difference that you're going to notice is that Street View has changed. Instead of finding it in the layers panel, you're going to now find a person icon or what's referred to as the peg man. <laughs> it looks like a little peg man piece that you might use on a, on a game board. It's in the upper right hand corner by the navigation tools. So if you zoom in on the ancestor location, you can just go up there to the right hand corner, click and drag the peg man icon onto the area where you want to look and see street view on the map. And after a second or two, some thick blue lines are going to pop up if Street View is available. Now, this is in place of the old camera icons that we used to see. And if they pop up, you know you've got Street View available. You just drop the icon right there on the map, and you'll immediately be flown in to Street View. I guess the Pegman icon is kind of supposed to represent that the view is going to be from a person's perspective down there at street level. Okay, another big difference is that Street View is more streamlined. Rather than clicking from one camera icon to the next like we used to to kind of move around, all you have to do is simply use the arrow keys on your keyboard to travel around. And as you do, the view continues to update automatically. It's really like driving through the Google map. It's amazing. The idea here is that it's doing its best to simulate that walking around the street experience. And as before, you can swing the map around for a complete 360 degree view, as well as look up and down. So you have all that navigation control. Now, of course, the best way to get a feel for the new street view is to kind of see it in action. And you can do that by watching the tutorial video that Google put together at youtube.com. It's called Learn Google Earth. Street View. And I will have the video for you in the show notes that you can watch it right there from the web page for this podcast episode. And of course, remember that Street View also incorporates 3D buildings. They're adding more and more every day. It's something we cover in depth in Google Earth for Genealogy Volume 2 DVD. And it is really cool. It just adds so much to the experience. So keep that in mind. Be sure and go over to the layers panel on the left hand side at the bottom and check mark that 3D buildings box in the layers panel so that you can activate it and make sure that you're seeing Google Earth at its full capacity with those 3D buildings. So again, what's prompting all this change? Well, here's what Google is saying about Google Earth 6.0. Quote, in Google Earth 6, we're taking realism in the virtual globe to the next level with two new features, a truly integrated street view experience and 3D trees. We've also made it even easier to browse historical imagery. When Google was first introduced, people were wowed by the ability to virtually fly from outer space right down to the roof of their house. While flying over rooftops gives you a superhuman view of our world, the ground level is where we experience our daily lives. We took our first baby steps towards bringing the Google Earth experience to street level with our implementation of Street View in Google Earth in 2008, which enabled flying into Street View panoramas. In Google Earth 6, the Street View experience is now fully integrated so you can journey from outer space right to your doorstep in one seamless flight. They also say that now you'll notice that Pegman is docked right alongside the navigation controls, an ever-present travel companion ready whenever you want to get your feet on the street and take a virtual walk around. Just pick up Pegman and drop him wherever you see a highlighted blue road to fly right down to the ground. Once there, you can use the navigation controls on your mouse to look around. And unlike our earlier street view layer, you can now move seamlessly from one location to another as if you're walking down the street by using the scroll wheel on your mouse or the arrow keys on your keyboard. If you want to visit somewhere farther away, simply click the exit button and you'll immediately return to an aerial view where you can easily fly to your next destination." End quote. Now, as you just heard, in addition to Street View, they also added a new feature, 3D trees. They've added millions of trees to Google Earth well, these aren't likely to help you genealogically, they are kind of a pleasant addition. 
Although I have to say, there are times when they just darn well get in the way. <laughs> so if you would like to enjoy those leafy additions, just select the 3D Buildings layer in the Layers panel. But if they are getting in your way from really seeing what you need to see on Street View, unclick the 3D Buildings layer in that Layers panel on the left-hand side, and they will kind of flatten down, and you can really see the buildings in the area you're looking at. Now, as you know from the Google Earth for genealogy videos and DVDs, Google Earth's historical imagery feature enables you to visually go back in time to see such things as Warsaw, Poland in 1935, London in 1945, and even Port-au-Prince, Haiti, before and after the devastating earthquake of January 2010. But it wasn't always obvious when historical imagery was available for a particular place which really made that feature, you know, one of the lesser known gems in Google Earth and kind of difficult to work with. Well, in the new 6.0 version, they have made it easier to find historical imagery. So now, when you fly to an area where historical imagery is available, the date of the oldest imagery that's available is going to appear in the status bar at the bottom of the screen. That's new. If you click on the date, you'll instantly be taken back in time to view imagery from that time period, that oldest available imagery. The historical imagery controller, which is typically controlled by the button at the top toolbar, that will automatically appear so that you can browse through all of the available historical imagery for that location, or you can simply close the time control and return to the regular default view. It is very slick and it's a great time saver. So keep an eye out for that. If you haven't been trying out historical imagery, this may prompt you to do so. Now I've been using version six since it was launched and I do think it's pretty good. I can definitely see what they were going for in trying to create a simple and yet, you know, a seamless integrated street view experience. That's pretty neat. There are still some kinks to be worked out though, I must warn you. So, you know, sometimes when you're moving around the street view images get distorted because of the way they're sort of knitted together. This is pretty new stuff. But I do think that we will see improvement as the technology evolves. And of course, as they update and make, you know, better images. The great thing is that even though access to Street View has changed from selecting a layer to dragging and dropping this little pegman icon, what Street View can do for your research really remains the same. It's a very powerful tool. So that's the latest and the greatest on the new version of Google Earth, which you can use to explore your ancestors' world. And of course, if you want to learn more about how to use Google Earth for genealogy, and let me tell you, it's a powerhouse, I've got the answers for you. Those are in the Google Earth for Genealogy DVD series, and it's available at googleforgenealogy.com. Profile America, Thursday, January 6th. One of the most influential comic strips in American history was seen for the first time this week in 1929. Buck Rogers in the 25th century. The first science fiction comic strip, Buck Rogers caught the imagination of a generation already enthused about aviation and early rocket research, and featured inventions based on scientific possibility. The strip appeared in newspapers for 38 years and spawned a movie serial, books for juveniles, a radio show, and later a television series and a feature motion picture. When Buck Rogers first burst on the public awareness, there were nearly 2,000 daily newspapers, read by more than 39 million subscribers. Today, there are just over 1,400 dailies, with a circulation close to 49 million. Profile America is in its 14th year as a public service of the U.S. Census Bureau. Well, we loaded you up with a lot of new gems today and lots of new information about what's new over at Google. I hope you had a good time here on Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 103. I hope that you will drop me a line and let me know if you have any questions or comments. Would love to share it here on the podcast in the mailbox. You can email me at genealogygemspodcast 
at gmail.com. Or better yet, don't be shy. Leave me a voicemail. You can call in at 925-272-4021 and maybe we'll play it here on the show. And for those of you premium members out there, and we have lots of new ones who joined us over the holidays, I've got some really fun and exciting uh, new episode for you. This is Genealogy Gems premium episode number 61 just got published. I really enjoyed putting this one together. This was fun. We've got some news, some mailbox stuff. And if you like Google Earth, boy, do we have a project there that came to us from a premium member that is just fantastic. And not only am I going to talk to you about it, tell you how this worked, but I also have a video for you taking you on a tour so you can really see the potential of what other genealogists out there are doing with this information. It is really cool. And we are also, in premium episode number 61, going to be thinking historically. This has really been on my mind lately, and I came across this terrific brief video, and we are going to talk about five aspects of historical thinking. This is key. You know, we can start off the new year getting organized and, you know, putting our binders together and starting our databases, but in reality... If we aren't really thinking accurately and historically about our research, it's kind of all for naught. So we've got five great aspects of historical thinking for you to concentrate on for the new year. And finally, the final gem on that episode is we're going to tell you what you can find in newspapers online. It just keeps getting better. So that is Genealogy Gems Premium episode number 61. If you haven't already become a premium member, would love to have you join us. We have a great time, <laughs> uh, podcasts and videos. And just head on over to genealogygems.com and click the Join Today button. We'd love to have you join us. And I will have a new edition of the Genealogy Gems e-newsletter coming out to you to let you know about this episode as well as what's going on with premium. But be sure and open those up when you get those in your email box, because I'm not only telling you about the new episodes that are coming up, but I've always tucked in there at least one or two great gems. These are things that we just don't get to on the show, but I want to make sure that you hear about them. You know, research techniques, great websites, fun stories that are inspiring. There's always good stuff in there. And do me a favor. If you enjoy that e-newsletter, and, and believe me, we try to put lots of time and effort into uh, lovingly putting those together for you because we really want you to enjoy everything that's going on here at Genealogy Gems. If you enjoy the newsletter, you see a neat little article in there or something that you think would help a friend or your genealogy society, do me a favor. Would you please forward it to your friends? We've included a little, quick little button on there that makes that real easy to do. You can also like it. <laughs> if you're a Facebook user, you know what I'm talking about. You can click the little like button and you can like the uh, newsletter and it will post it on your wall and share it with other people and kind of get the word out so that they can join in on the fun and join us here on the podcast. Thank you very much for doing that. I really appreciate it. And I want to finally say a really big thank you. You guys are so conscientious and caring about this show and helping me keep it going. And you were just terrific as usual, but even more so in the month of December in doing so much of your online shopping through the links that we have on the website, in particular, amazon.com. It's so easy to do. You can click that Amazon button in the toolbar, or just use the search box on the homepage of our website. And so many of you did that. And it just makes such a difference. It really helps us cover the costs. There's no reason we're going to pod fade around here. So I'm going to be with you as long as you'll have me. And um, I really appreciate your support in doing that. Keep up the great work. It's so easy to do. And it just makes such a difference. You really are making a difference. So thank you. So that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.